Okay. Thank you all very much for being here, those that can come in person. Um, and I'd like to say hello to everyone out there in virtual land on YouTube watching this. Um, welcome to our first Friday uh, for November. Uh, we are really, really lucky and very excited to have um, our special guest today, Thomas Dawson. Um, Mr. Dawson is uh, a faculty member for us, as you, most of you probably know, and you may have even taken a class with him on audio engineering or composition. Um, and we're going to hear him talk a little bit about his life in music uh, and uh, various other topics and we'll get to pick his brain a little bit. Um, but let me give you a, a brief kind of bio. You, you've probably been sent the bio, but um, so Mr. Thomas Dawson is the musical director and co-founder of the Center for Harmonic Health and Healing. He is an accomplished musician, producer, composer, and film editor who collaborates with some of the most successful artists in the music industry today. Mr. Dawson has performed on stage with internationally renowned artists such as Kelly Rowland, Eric Bennett, Howard Hewitt and the Commodores. His credits also include projects with J-Lo, Beyonce, and the gospel legends, the Winans. He is currently the Commodores music director and lead keyboardist, and has co-produced many of their songs and CDs. As computer technology has become more vital in every aspect of the mu music industry, Mr. Dawson has excelled as a consummate recording engineer. His experience and training as a musician combined with his knowledge of computer technology has made him one of the most sought after studio engineers in the business. Mr. Dawson has been integral, integral in the development of the vibroacoustic programs utilized by the Center of Harmonic Healing and Health and Healing. Sorry, the Center for Harmonic Health and Healing. His collaboration with Dr. Dr. Nickelberry ignited within him a desire to use his extraordinary musical gifts as a vehicle for healing. The very talented Mr. Dawson will continue to be at the forefront of the music industry as well as an innovator in the healing arts. So we are super lucky to have him as a member of our faculty. Our students really, really benefit um, from, from his mentorship. Um, and let me also close uh, by saying that Thomas was also uh, very important in the development of the technology in the recording studio. Um, without his help, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have the, the equipment in that studio. And uh, anecdotally, uh, it was quite amazing. Towards the end of the, of the design, actually, the, the building was being constructed during the middle of the construction process. Um, he invited me out to, um, to NAN, the, what is it, the North National Association, Association for Music, Mer Merchants. music Merchants. Uh -huh. It's the largest music industry um, uh, uh, conference? Show. Yeah, like trade show. Or something. Trade show yeah. in the world every January in Anaheim, California. And he introduced me around to uh, all kinds of people who were top people in, in these music technology companies told him about the project, told him about the building, and they put together a package for us and presented it to the campus uh, to build the studio, and the campus actually reallocated about $100,000 to the creation of, of the technology in that studio. So we, have to, we really thank you for that, Thomas. That was extremely generous of you. Um, so without further ado, Thomas. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Whitehead. Uh, he's the reason that I'm here, and a very dear friend, and a very great mentor for me as well. So thank you for having me. Uh, gosh, I would like to, well, welcome everyone. Um, I would like to kind of talk about my journey and, and what that's looked like uh, for me, and, and hopefully it gives you some insight that's what's possible for you. I believe in all things are possible if you believe, if you think it, it can manifest. So there's a few things that I really believe in my heart that I think it goes to the core of, of who I am. And one, one of those things is that I believe that there are two important days of your life. 
The first important day of your life is the day you were born, your birthday. The second most important day of your life is the day you know why. The day you know why you were born and when you connect that, I feel it changes everything. It changes your perspective. Because perspective, to me, you can have multiple perspectives on the way you look at things. If I look at my hand, and if you look at your hand this way, that's one perspective. If you turn your hand around, that's a different perspective, and it looks different, but it's the same hand. So my journey started with, with me believing I was always put here to be a musician. There was never any doubt in my mind as a child. I knew I was going to do music. And for me, music came very easy for me um, in a way that I didn't understand at the time. But if I saw an instrument for the first time, I can pick it up and I could just play it. Didn't always play it great, but I innately knew something that I didn't really understand, but it could just happen. So um, I had a lot of great experiences that seemed like they were, could have been looked at as a tragedy, but turned into a treasure. So I don't always react when things don't seem to go like I had planned. I sort of sit back and enjoy the ride and see where the destination is. When I was at college and I was your age, uh, I was in a marching band at Southern University, uh, which is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is a very famous university for the music program. Now, I come from a state that a big part of tourism is Louisiana food and Louisiana's music. So, me being a marching band student, and I was a trumpet major and a piano major, but as a student, our college band director, Dr. Isaac Greggs, was a great band director and had a great marching band, and this band would perform around the world. We performed for presidents and Super Bowls. Huge, huge deal. Dr. Greggs also had a jazz band, which was the Isaac Gregg's Jazz Sextet. And after marching band rehearsal on Tuesday nights, they would rehearse in the office next to the band hall. And they were playing this jazz music, and it was really Dixieland music. And Dr. Gregg's was sort of like a, a Louis Armstrong kind of guy. He's, he's, he, he didn't really sound like him singing, but he played a lot like Louis Armstrong. And they would tour around the world being ambassadors for the state of Louisiana through music. And I would watch them practice on Tuesday nights, and I was just long to play that music and be in the band. Flash forward a few months later, I'm walking down the music department, and this is before cell phones and text messaging, if any of you guys could remember that, or you may not have any clue that there once was a life before that. But the interesting thing was one of, the, one of my fellow students saw me in the hall and said, Dawson, Dr. Gregg wants to see you in his office. I was like, whoa, what did I do? I'm in trouble. So I go to his office. He said, Dawson, yes, sir. I heard you play bass guitar. Uh, yes, I didn't, I didn't publicize it. I would practice you know, by myself most of the time. He said, do you have your base here on campus? I said, yes, sir. Do you have a suit? Yeah, I have a black suit. In my... Okay, let me tell you what's going on. My jazz band has just been asked to perform for a sickle cell anemia telethon. It's going to be televised. And it's a fundraiser, so there's no money to be made. And my bass player said if it wasn't pay playing any, if it wasn't paying any money, he wasn't going to play. 
I said, Dr. Greggs, I don't care about any money. I just want to play. He said, okay, well, go get your bass and meet me back and bring your suit. And meet me back here in 15, 20 minutes. And I'm going to take you over a quick rehearsal of the music. And we're going to go do the telethon. I said, yay, I'm so excited. And then I run and get my bass. And then I realize as I'm getting my bass, I've never played jazz before. I don't know how to play a swing. Then I kind of remember, I try to remember what I would hear them play in the rehearsals when I watched them rehearse. And I kind of learned a quick 12 bar bass line and then I ran back to the room. And he gets on the piano and we're going through the music and I don't have it. I'm not even close to not having it. We gotta go. So, uh, and I have my little Sears and Robux, Robux silver tone bass amp that it worked fine. We took it to the television station. We get set up. Now it's time, we're on the air. Boom, let's go. And the first note, my bass amp just craps out. <laughs> nothing. And I'm playing and nothing is coming out. So have you guys ever heard of air guitar? You, you heard that term? I'm the inventor of that, that was me. So the second song we play, same deal, no bass. So after that, I'm feeling this small, tragedy, right? I'm feeling this small and I'm on the corner packing my bass and packing my amp and the rest of the band over here in this corner and they're in a little huddle and they're talking. And I know the conversation has to be about me, so I'm trying to figure out, is there another door I can go out so I don't have to walk past them and see this and hear what's obviously is about to happen. But no way out, I had to walk there. And they stopped me and they called me over. And I really have my head down because I'm so embarrassed. They said, one of the guys said, Dawson, do you want to join the band? What? Join the band after how I just embarrassed anybody? And the piano player, Mr. Clarence Jones said, if Thomas wants to join the band, I'll teach him the music. Heck yeah. Now we go into rehearsal for about two weeks. I'm like a fish in water. I got it, it's second nature, got it down. Our next performance, from this free performance of Sickle Cell and Union Telethon, the next performance we played was the pregame football show for the Atlanta Falcons and the New Orleans Saints in Mexico City, nationally televised. That was my first professional gig. Now I'm a member of the delegation that travels the world touring to promote Louisiana music around the world. We're playing all the embassies in the world. We're playing, I mean, all over the place. And I'm a student. I'm in my second, I'm in my second year of college. But that opened me up to, from a tragedy to a treasure. Now I'm the only student in the band. All the other guys are either band directors or professional musicians. So I got a chance to get tutelage from these great musicians. And I wasn't the strongest bass player starting out, but I had to play with one of the strongest drummers in the country, Roy Stewart. He was a big jazz, big band drummer that I had to raise my game. He taught me to raise my game because I had to play with him. It's that old adage that if you're gonna be a better tennis player, you play with better players and it raises your game. It's sort of, it forces you into that without you even knowing it. So that was the first part of that part of my education as a bass player. Now I moved to California, but just be, even, well, let me step back just a second. When I was in college, your age, I went to one of the second major concerts I ever attended was a Commodore's concert at the LSU Assembly Center and I was in the audience watching 
And I said, man, I told my cousin, man, one day I'm going to be playing with the Commodores. I felt it. I said it. Didn't think any more about it. I just knew it. And end of story. Now, I had always been a bass player in college as well as a piano player. At this point, I had been playing more bass than anything. But when I saw myself playing with the Commodores in the audience, for some reason, I did not see myself playing bass. I saw myself playing keyboards. And that reality happened. And it's currently going on even today. So how that happened, I was, I was, I had moved to LA. I'm selling pianos at a piano store, Sherman Clay, and they were a big Steinway dealer. And I told my wife, you know what? I didn't move all the way to California to sell pianos. I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to have to pursue this music thing full time. Because a friend of mine told me, Thomas, it's going to be difficult for you to compete with the people who are doing this all day, every day, and you're doing it part time. So you may have to make a decision. And I took that to heart. I told my manager at the piano store, I have to quit. He said, no problem. I go home. And after that, wow, what am I going to do? Then a friend of mine called me who was a record producer, and I had done some sessions for him. He said, hey, Thomas, I heard the Commodores are looking for a new piano player. Are you interested? Heck yeah. He gave him the phone number. I called Walter, and he says, Walter was the lead singer of Commodore, still is, the one that sings Brick House and Joe Brick House. Called me over to his house. Hey, can you come by at uh, 7 o'clock, you know, on Thursday? Sure. Come by, and, and the band is there rehearsing. But the keyboard player at this point didn't know he's about to be replaced, so it's a kind of a hush-hush kind of deal. Uh, so I show up. I'm here, and there's about five other piano players there. Okay, wow, that's great. So we're having a conversation now. He's talking to each of the piano players. And they have, I had just moved to LA. These guys had resumes that were like this. They had played with everybody. And I felt so unqualified to even be in the room. And when they listed their resume, I couldn't say anything. I played a little jazz, and I played at my church. I didn't. I had never played R and B music. I played jazz. So after everybody left, I went up to Walter and I said, "Mr. Orange, you have some great talent here tonight, and and I understand you're going to probably pick one of those guys, and I completely understand that. But if you would give me a tape of the show, I would learn it." on my dime and on my time, and if you're ever in a bind and need someone, I'll know the show. The next week, I got the phone call that said the Commodores wants to hire you. The Commodores at that time, in my college years, was one of the biggest groups in the world. Sold over 60 million records today. And I used to listen to their records and mimic and imagine myself playing with them in my bedroom to all of a sudden now I am their keyboard player. And now I've been with them 30 years. I'm their music director and I co-produce their records. What happened and how does that happen? I just believed it would happen and I didn't question it. So I want to talk, the other thing for me I want to allow you to think about is the reason we do music and why we do music. I believe that some people choose to do music and I believe that some people are chosen to do music. And when you're chosen, you really don't have a choice in the matter. One thing I learned from Quincy Jones about music is your music would never be any more or any less than you are 
as a person. Whoa, Quincy, that's heavy, that's deep. What does that mean? Because music comes from the expression of your being. Have you ever wondered why two singers can sing the same song and one singer you say, oh yeah, that was kind of cute, that's nice. And the next singer just completely blows you away and it seems like to levitate you into a whole another atmosphere. Same lyrics, same song, same key. What's that difference? Because we think a lot of times in terms of technique and technique is important. I think there's two perspectives on technique. Technique is the ability to have the facility to execute on your instrument. I think technique is also having the ability to make the audience feel exactly what you want them to feel when you want them to feel it. Wow, that technique. So going through all of that, and this is something I've just learned in my quest as I'm continuing to evolve as a musician. I've learned that there's an important word for me. Um, and it's an African term. Uh, and it's spelled U-B-U-N-T-U. Ubuntu. And the philosophy of that is, and this is what I've learned for me in my musical journey that has been constant and consistent. Ubuntu talks about, I am, I am because we are. It's the joint, there's a connection that we have as humans in our humanity that is invisible, but we're connected. My success is tied to your success, and your success is tied to my success. There was a missionary that went to South Africa, and there was these kids, and she said, okay, I wanna do a game with these kids. I'm gonna put this basket of candy under this tree, and I'll have this, the children stand 40 yards back, and when I say go, I want you to race to the tree. Whoever gets to the tree and to the basket of candy first wins. And they get the prize, they get the candy. And she said she noticed when she said go, all the kids joined hands and ran to the tree together. When they got there, they shared the candy equally among each other. And she said, my goodness, what is this? I've never seen this. Why do you do that? And one child said, because I'm not happy unless everyone else is happy. Our shared humanity. So for the music situation, when we, music is a gift and we are givers as musicians and artists, the whole arts. That's what we do, that's what we're put here for. So if we have this incredible ability, then there's a motive and a reason why we wanna do it to a really positive effect. Um, if there's coherence in your heart, and if your heart is in balance, then what then that creates a measurable magnetic field that actually extends beyond you. That magnetic field is actually energy. And that energy is actually frequency. So, there's, there's some place I'm going with all this, but I want to introduce you to the concepts of the why. Um, for me as a musician, I've had the ability to 
almost experienced everything I ever wanted to in this musical life. I played and worked with everybody I had on my list as a kid I wanted to work with, from the Stevie Wonders to the Michael Jacksons. I've had that opportunity. Um, as a recording studio owner and learning the recording business, the Commodores had a deal where that got me to the recording industry was my second year as with the Commodores, they had signed a contract to do, to re-record all of their greatest hits. By, by then, Lionel Richie had already left. The Commodores signed this deal with a company called KTEL Music, who, would, who was famous for releasing, re-releasing records. And the Commodores signed this deal that they were gonna do this, you know, re reproduce this music. But the Commodores thought in his, and they assume, and they assume wrongly, that they were gonna get the master recordings from Motown. And Motown said, no, this is your music, but these are our masters, we paid for this. Now the Commodores are stuck. They have a signed contract with no music. They came to me and Harold Hudson, who was the music director at the time, who was in the beginning with the Commodores, and wrote some of their hit songs. They said, Harold, you and Thomas, you guys are gonna have to recreate all of this music, 20 of the greatest hits, and it has to sound identical to the greatest hits. Whoa, and you have nine months to do it. Whoa, okay. We had to listen and transcribe every single note on those 20 records and re-record them with computers now. What we, the smart thing we did was that we hired the original engineer who had engineered all of those records and recorded and, and, and mixed General by the name of Cal Harris. He was the chief engineer for Motown at the time. So we would lay out three songs, we record it at my studio at home, then we'll take it over to the Cal Harris's big studio and we would transfer the music from my computer to his big multi-track machines. And then the Commodores would come in and do vocals. We did that whole record in nine months. And it was great but I got a chance to listen and to study with Cal Harris as my engineering mentor. And the thing that I learned and I appreciate it and I grasp from Cal Harris is that he was never, he was never comfortable and stagnant with his zeal for learning technology. He said, wow, this is an engineer that has hit all these gold records and recorded all these hit songs. And the next new technology that's coming out, it was always a battle between who was gonna get the first one. It's, it was either Stevie Wonder or Cal Harris. Stevie got it, sometime Cal. And I noticed Cal Harris also learned to program these synthesizers. And he was, wait a minute, he's an engineer, but he's playing keyboards and all this, whoa. But I grasped that, that he was always hungry and always excited about it. Because technology keeps moving on, whether we want it to or not, technology keeps going. So I moved to Nashville years ago when the technology was changing, when there was a thing called the Lynn drum machine. The Lynn drum machine was the first uh, drum machine that really sounded like real drums. Before that, the 808s and things sounded like a little toy, but it wasn't a drum, so drummers were not intimidated. The Lynn drum comes out and all of the drummers are in uproar. We're about to be replaced. Oh, whoa, whoa, what are we gonna do? We're we gonna stand against this technology. When I moved to Nashville, uh, the gentleman Perry Sanders, who owns the mining exchange and all that, he is a great musician, he's a great attorney, and dear friend of mine, and we own a recording studio together. So when we moved the studio to Nashville, we picked up a partner by the name of Eddie Bears Jr. At that time, 
Eddie Bears Jr. was the number one session drummer in Nashville. He was doing four sessions a day. All the hits Eddie Bears was playing drums on. But the thing I noticed when the drummers were talking about, we're about to be replaced with this Lindrum. Eddie is already doing most of the sessions, but now studios are starting to replace real drummers with this machine. I noticed Eddie's response. He's the one that's gonna be the most affected by it because he's the top of the food chain. What Eddie Bears did as his response to that was he bought four, four Lindrum machines and he learned to program them. And the studios that wanted the electronic drums, he rented it to those studios. And he did the live sessions that they wanted the live drummer. He embraced the technology and made it work. That was the philosophy for me that I learned and I still implement into my life. After being a musician and doing studio work, and it was one thing that opened up something for me with frequencies that I was asked to uh, score this film. And they said, well, we don't have a budget. And I said, <laughs> that means they don't have a big budget, but they've got a budget. And they really meant they had no budget, but also they had no budget for the sound engineer, the dialogue. I said, okay, well, here's an opportunity. Here's an opportunity for me to learn on the job. So I became the dialogue editor the sound effects editor, and the composer. Typically what happens in a mixing stage on a film, when you're putting the film together, people are usually working in different locations. You have the dialogue editor working here. You have the sound effects guys, they're doing their sound effects. You have um, the music guys over here and he's creating his music. It all comes together on the mixing stage now. Now, in the mixing stage, some things are getting deleted, deleted because they're interfering. We can't have the music up too loud right here because it's interfering with dialogue. We can't have the music too loud here because the sound effects are here. But everybody who contributed, you want your part really up loud because you're proud of it. Hey, I want my music loud. I want my sound effects loud. So this was an opportunity that I had all of the elements and I'm responsible for all of it now. I said, wait a minute, I don't have to compete. I'm responsible for everything. So at this point, and from this point forward, I said to myself, everything in the film is now the score. It's a part of the music score. And then I asked myself, if there's a sound effect playing here, and I have a music cue, why can't the sound effect be in the same key of the music? Oh, here's some dialogue and it's a little difficult to hear. Why don't I pitch this a little higher and put the dot? Because dialogue is tone, there's a tone. Let me pitch my dialogue in the key of the music and the key of the sound effects. And when I did that, something opened up in the film and it was a transparency that wasn't there. It was a film called The Dr. John Cyril Story. It's a documentary. That film swept in every film festival it was entered in. It won across the board. Now, I put that away and I'm in LA. I'm gonna get to the next part of this about frequencies. I'll tell you a quick story on how I got there. There was, when I'm living in LA, there was a friend of mine who was a chiropractor, and his name is Herb. And he was famous practice, practiced for 21 years as he was the chiropractor for the Lakers. Herb lived a couple blocks from me. And Herb actually told me, hey, you know what? When I was a kid, 
in sixth and seventh grade, I played bass guitar. And nothing else ever made me feel the way I felt when I was playing music. He walked away from his 21 year of practice. He downscaled it. He sold the, the expensive cars. He sold the big house on the hill, lived very modest, but he went back to music school to become a bass player. So I would play with Herb on gigs. Then I moved to Colorado Springs and I'm sitting at my house playing the piano and Herb calls to check on me. Hey Thomas, how are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just doodling in the back on the piano. And he said, there it is again, man. I said, what Herb? He said, Thomas, dude, man, every time you play, man, I see colors. He said, man, I see colors with, you know, Mozart, I see with Beethoven, I see with Duke Ellington. He said, dude, I see more colors off you than I do any of them. I'm like, what? He said, man, I don't know if you realize this, but we as doctors, we know there are frequencies that we can cure diseases with. I was like, what? He said, hey, Thomas, I see you doing concerts and people will be healed from you playing. What? He said, hey, man, you are a healer and you're going to have to deal with that. I'm like, what in the world is this now? So after that, the next day I get a phone call from a friend of mine by the name of Molly Lord. Molly, and I'd love to get her here, Glenn. Molly Lord does a three-day seminar on, I think it's called Tune In, what it teaches you, or, or maybe it's Tune Up. Forgive me, Molly. It's either one or the other. But she teaches how listening to music can raise your vibration levels from different levels. It's a, three, it's a magnificent seminar. So Molly comes over and we talk and I tell Molly, hey Molly, my friend tells me I'm a healer and I don't know what to do with this. Thomas, I think there's a, someone I need you to speak with, a lady by the name of Regina Murphy in Las Vegas. She never answers the phone, but let me call her and introduce you. She, now, she calls Regina. Now what Regina is, is she's a therapist that treats diseases with tuning forks, with frequencies. It's sort of like acupuncture with sound. And I thought that was pretty fascinating. She calls Regina, Regina answers on the first phone call, the first ring. Molly says, I have Thomas here. Uh, he's the music director of the Commodores, but a friend told him he was a music healer and I told him he should talk with you. And Regina goes, oh my God, you're the one. The one what? You're the one we've been waiting for. And she said, but Thomas, you're not going to have to research this. I'm going to give you all of my research, and I'm going to give you my hard drive with the healing frequencies on it. Frequencies, what are frequencies? Everything in the universe is vibrating, whether we know it or not. Everything in the universe has a resonant frequency. Uh, years ago, there was this commercial where you would see this classical singer, and there was another commercial that did Ella Fitzgerald, and there was a commercial, Is It Live? Is It Memorex? Which was a cassette tape. And it was so, the commercial was just so real, you can't tell the difference. So they played the recording of them singing this note, and the crystal glass shatters. And we always thought that was really cool. But the reason the glass, the science is, the reason the glass shattered because the note she sang was the resonant frequency of the glass. The same reason in the military, soldiers aren't allowed to march in formation across bridges because their marching could excite the resonant frequency of the bridge and the bridge would collapse. So if everything has a resonant frequency also, every cell in our body has a resonant frequency. Dr. Rural Rife, R-I-F-E, discovered uh, what diseases are susceptible to different frequencies and pitches. You can actually destroy a cancer cell with the frequency that's a resonant frequency of that cancer cell, but it won't affect any other cells. 
mind-boggling to me. I just got put into this whole world of another reason for, and in closing, because I don't have much more time, do I? We're good? Okay. Okay, great. I will. Okay, so this will be the last statement for me. Out of all of the things I've done musically for me that I felt were great things for me and accomplishments that, I, that happened for me, there was this one kid, nine years old, his name is James. By now, Regina had given me the hard drive with the frequencies, and I told her, I think I want to compose some music because she's using a lot of music, a lot of classical music. She said, uh, I said, you know, I think I want to compose something for you. What are the parameters? What, what do I need to know? She said, well, I can't tell you what to do. God's going to have to lead you in that. But I can tell you our treatments are 20 to 30 minutes. Sometimes they're an hour. She said, Thomas, but no one does a 30-minute song. You know, most people give us a five-minute song, and then we would just repeat it. I said, no, you don't understand. If it was supposed to be 30 minutes, God is not going to give me 29. He's going to give me 30. We, I, the music comes to me. I send it to her. Regina said, oh, my God, I feel like I'm in heaven. Do you mind if I use this for our Parkinson patients? We want to put the frequency of Parkinson in your music. No problem. At that point, because she's a therapist, and her client at that point was Eric Hilton, one of Conrad Hilton's sons, uh, the famous Hilton Hotel, that Conrad Hilton. Uh, he's in a wheelchair with Parkinson. He's slumped over. Regina took over the music, and she put bone conduction headphones in my, and by now, you guys are pretty know about bone conduction headphones now. It's, you're not putting, they don't go in your ear, they go right on your temple here. Um, and it's resonating that bone. Within three minutes, Eric Hilton is now sitting up. Within 20 minutes, he's being responsive now and engaging. And this is documented in Regina's book. Three months of listening to the music, 20 minutes a day. Mr. Hilton is back participating in board meetings. He's also, the negative side of that, different perspective, the negative side of that, he's also back at the Bellagio Hotel gambling every day, and the family wants to cut the program. So the next thing that Regina does, she says, Thomas, the frequencies of glioblastoma, I have a kid, James, he's nine years old. He has glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. I'm gonna, we're gonna infuse your music with the frequencies of glioblastoma. I'm gonna take it to him. She takes it to him. His mother gives him the headphones. He's listening. The mother comes back in the room and little James is crying. I said, James, why are you crying? That the music is so beautiful, I know the angels in heaven made it for me. Wow. Okay. James is cured. He was in a, maybe a 6% survival rate with this. Completely cured of cancer. And we're very careful to say we cure anything. But we facilitate healing. But his cancer is gone. A year and a half, still no cancer. And they're telling me, Thomas, your music healed them. No, 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 no. It really did. That's what did it. No, 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 no. no I can't take credit for that. No. Maybe I did a small part and it kind of helped because I knew he had taken chemo and radiation. So all those things together. Okay. And that's what I was believing. Now, at this point, he's been two years cancer-free, and now they want to fly me to Las Vegas to meet him personally and to do a television interview. 
Then I found out the story during the interview when his mother said, James was going to die. And the chemo was making him so sick that I didn't want to see my son die that way. If he's going to die anyway, you just let him die. They took him off of all, of, all medications. Then Regina Murphy delivered the frequencies to him. And today, I think it's four years later, James is still cancer free. So for me, the takeaway for me was that every concert I ever played, every song I've ever produced or, or wrote, they all pale in comparison to me doing something that saved a life. And that to me lined completely up with my purpose. Because we all have a small part to play in this if we accept the responsibility and the challenge. Isn't it interesting that no raindrop will ever stand up and say, I was responsible for the, for the flood. But actually, every raindrop is responsible for the flood. And not, and not a flood in a negative way, also in a positive way. A flood of anything, anything new. You, we all, as humans, we're all responsible for the betterment of humanity. And that's our job and call and honor as musicians and participants of the arts. And with that, I'll close and I will open it up for any questions. Good, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? That was fascinating, Thomas. Thank well, you so much. Well, thank that you, sir. super inspiring, too. Thank you. Um, Ubuntu. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that, that's, that's hard to you know, get a, I'm kind of reflect for a second on that. Um, just as a, as a quick observation before I ask a question, um, I think similarly the reason I, I fe also felt I'd never had a much a, a, a choice to be in music, yeah. um, although I did quit for a little while after my sophomore year, during my sophomore year in college, mm -hmm. and that was one of the the most uh, one of the biggest learning experiences I had. I, I w went, I turned around and came back again, uh -huh. but I f I felt distinctly off of my path. Um, to to uh, to follow up with your point about, um, you know, Joseph Campbell used to. There was a big, you know, he used to say and write these books on follow your bliss. And that if you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and because you truly love it and you're passionate about it, the world opens up for you. And I, I too, I really, really I believe, believe that. that's true. And I believe it's especially true in the arts and yeah. in, mu in music especially, of course, that's where we are. Yeah. Um, I think to all the students out here and, and, uh, and out there watching from afar, um, I hope you're starting to, to getting and, and hopefully believing that the music world is really, is quite vast and it's interconnected in so many areas of life yes. uh, that it's in some ways so much, much misunderstood and how big it actually is and how much opportunity exists to create from now into the future. Yeah. What do you, what advice would you give students just embarking, you know, on music careers, courageous enough to be music majors, mm -hmm. um, and especially in today's world? What kind of mm -hmm. advice, what do you see for the future for music? Okay, well, thank you for that question. Um, 
my advice to you is that to search for yourself, you obviously have already made a decision that this is who you are and this is what you want to do. Because for us, music is life and life is music and you can't separate it. It's all music. Our bodies communicate with different organs through music, through frequencies. Uh, there's a thing called sonic geometry that talks about no matter what geometric shape you can come up with, it translates, and I'll say this, the universe is tuned to the key of F sharp. Ah. If you take a circle, you do the circumference of a circle, that's 360 deg degrees, the circumference of a circle. If you put 360 hertz, which is frequencies, the note you will hear will be an F sharp. If you do a triangle, which is 180 degrees, that note, 180 hertz, is gonna be an F sharp. So it doesn't matter what shape you come up with, complex or what, octagon, hexagon, it doesn't matter. It's gonna be either, it can be only one of three notes. The frequency will be either an F sharp, an A sharp, or C sharp. Music majors, what chord is that? That's an F sharp major chord. So where technology is going, music is, we have now, and I've been waiting personally for this for 25 years, and it's here right now. And in my, and in my class, I'm exposing my students to what's called Dolby Atmos. If you notice in the television world, video has gotten bumps up for years. We've gone from standard definition television to high definition 720p, then we went to 1080p, and all this time, music and audio stayed at 48K 16-bit even though we had the ability to go higher sample rates. For the first time now, we are mixing music in this new platform called Dolby Atmos. And if you think of a traditional 5.1 surround system, you have a left speaker, a center speaker, a right speaker, a left rear, right rear, and you have an, two other speakers here, which is, makes it really like a 7.1. They're also adding speakers in the ceiling. We're putting four speakers in the ceiling. So now in the theater for mixing film and television, we have the ability to, if you hear a helicopter flying overhead, the sound is literally over your head. In this new technology, typically the way music was, and they're doing music in this technology, typically you had, you can place the sound in the left or between the left and right, you know, so you have maybe seven, eight locations you can play sound. With Dolby Atmos, we have what's called objects. Objects now, we can place 120, we can place sound in 128 different locations. You have not heard music until you hear it in this new technology. It's called immersive audio. It's also called 3D audio. Now there are opportunities that you can have your music mixed in this new format and released. Amazon HD Music and also Tidal both have subscription base. Well, you can listen to high definition immersive audio. Now you may think, oh wow, but I don't have an expensive system and all that. This is being translated into binaural music now, where you can listen to it and get this effect through your stereo headphones. That's why we know this technology is gonna stick. It's gonna be the new technology, it is here. Record labels are asking us to remix their catalog in this new format. There are artists that are performing concerts in this new format. There are venues that are being built now 
in Germany and here where speakers are all in the ceiling. I can speak personally to where this technology is going because right now, today, I'm involved in a project in Las Vegas with a great team of friends of mine. Rick Camp who was the chief engineer for J-Lo and Beyonce. He mixes all of their live concerts. We're doing a concert with Michael Jackson in this new immersive technology where we're taking the music. We're going to mix it in Dolby Atmos. We just got delivered today uh, two theater seats that are motion seats that when we create uh, it's going to be like a ride and you create this and the seats are moving and you're programming all of this with the music and we have LED screens that are completely covering everything in front, all the ceiling, all the left. It's sort of like VR in the live situation and all of that's happening right now. So all the new jobs I feel from engineering standpoint and music standpoints are going to be in this new technology. The field just completely opened up. This is brand new territory. During a pandemic, wow, we had a chance to refocus and reevaluate, and technology is moving this fast. I've never been so excited, and I've been waiting for this jump for 25 years. Wow. Thank you. That, uh, so there's hope for the future. Uh, <laughs> There's so much hope for the future. That's really, really good to hear. I, I think our students really need to hear uh, things like this right now. Yeah. Um, when so m there's so much doubt, and especially about our field, mm -hmm. uh, where essentially it looks like it's shut down, right? And particularly, live, uh, of course, live performances are, are mm -hmm. shut down. Um, Delayed, but not denied. Right. What's coming on the other side? I, yeah. I like to point to the, la the last pandemic, um, 1917, 1918. Of course, there was a lot, of, a lot of other things going on in the world at that time, but what, yeah. what came after that? Hmm. What came after the last pandemic in the music world that changed the face of music forever? Yes. The, yep. the roaring 20s. 20s, yeah. Um, I like to think that there's something like that coming. And it's gonna be a whole new 21st century version of our own roaring 20s as we're in 2020 right now. Yes, I believe that. I believe that, I agree with that. And the part that excites me about that is that you're the guys that's gonna do it. Yeah. That's what's exciting. This is not a limitation, this is actually an opportunity. It really is all in how you look at it. Music would never be the same, and that's a great thing. It's gonna evolve, it always does, and it always will. I'm excited for you to be a part of this. It's happening now in your prime. You're, you're learning, and this is your time. This is, I really get emotional about it. I really mm -hmm. get excited about it because I'm not gonna live long enough to see the evolution of it, but you will. You'll be the part of it. I'm excited about seeing the beginning of this new part of this. So, we're just about out of time. Um, I think that, that what you should take from, from this is take a lot of things. Um, this has been super inspiring, but learn everything you can. If you look at Thomas's example, I, I just love it. One of the best things about being in music is the people that you meet. And you meet fascinating people um, who are, are all so different and talented in so many different ways. And, and Thomas is one of those people for me. Um, just so happy to work with him and be around him. Um, and the, the breadth of his musicianship is a really, really good example. And you're all capable of that, of being a consummate musician, being as good as you can, learn as much as you can, have as much breadth and depth as you can, and it will take you places. Yes. Right? So can, I, can we have a big hand for Thomas Dawson here? Thank you so much for being with us today. And well, it was my <laughs> highest honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
working here. I should uh, say that, that the, the, the reason that I'm the only faculty mem member here is that we happen to have our all college meeting, which happens twice a year, that started at noon. And so this is our dean's first meeting, and so they really wanted to be at that meeting. Um, and of course, they're going to be watching the, the tape of this. So thank you all for being here. We, we really appreciate it uh, to have you here in the, in the venue, in the hall. <laughs>